Chapter Seven of *The Empty Sack* by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Seven. Shall I ever go in or out of this door again? Jenny lingered on the threshold to ask herself this question, and as she did so, saw Bob Collingham lift his hat. For the time being, she had forgotten him. That is. She had a way of putting him out of her mind, except when, as he expressed it to herself, he came bothering her. Bothering her meant asking her to marry him, which he had done perhaps twenty times. Each time she refused him, she considered that it was for good. There was a quality in him that raised her ire, a certainty that, pressed by need, she would one day come to him. That, Jenny said to herself, would be the last thing. She wouldn't do it as long as there was any other possibility on earth. In view, however, of the state of things at home, and Ray's cold-bloodedness at the studio, it had sometimes seemed to her of late as if earth would not afford her any other possibility. If she welcomed him now, it was chiefly as a distraction from thoughts which, were she to keep dwelling on them, would drive her mad. Her temperament being naturally happy, anguished was the more anguishing for being so unnatural. The mere necessity of having to strive with Bob called forth in her that spirit of sex-wrestling which was not so much second nature in her as it was first. She greeted him, therefore, with a sick little smile, and allowed him to limp along beside her. The studio building was in a street in the thirties and east of Lexington Avenue. To take the way by which she usually went, they sauntered towards the sunset. "'You're in trouble, Jenny, aren't you?' The kindly tone touched her. He was always kind. He was always looking for little things he could do. It was part of the trouble with him, from her point of view, that he was so watchful and overshadowing. He poured out so much more than her cup was able to receive, that he frightened her. All the same, his sympathy, coming at this minute, started her tears afresh. "'Is it things at home?' he persisted, when she didn't respond. Thinking this enough for him to know, she admitted that it was. "'I've got something in my pocket that would, that would help all that, in the long run.' From anyone else it would have alarmed her. She would have taken it to mean money, money which she would in her own way be expected to repay. As it was, she merely turned her swimming eyes towards him in mild curiosity. Look! Seeing a little white box which could contain nothing but a ring held between his thumb and forefinger on the edge of his waistcoat pocket, she flushed with annoyance. I think you'd better go away, she said coldly, pausing to give him the chance to take his leave. "'And chuck you back upon your trouble?' The argument was more effective than he knew. Jenny became aware that even this little bit of drama had put home conditions and raised cruelty a perceptible distance behind her. It was sheer terror of being thrown on them again that induced her to walk on, tacitly permitting him to stay with her. "'You can't be saved from one kind of trouble by getting into another,' she argued ungraciously. The fire's not much of a relief from the frying-pan. It is if it doesn't burn you, if it only warms and comforts you and makes it easier to live. This fire would burn me to death. Oh, no, it wouldn't, because I'd be there. I'd be the stoker to see that it was kept in the furnace. The furnace in the house, Jenny, is like the heart in the body, something out of sight, but hot and glowing and cheering everybody up. If she could have listened to such words from Hubert Ray, she thought, how enraptured she would have been. Did you ever hear the story of the guy who gave us fire in the first place? Bob continued as she walked on and said nothing. You know we didn't have any fire on earth, at least that's the tune to which the rig is sung. The gods had fire in heaven, but men had to, to shiver. Why didn't they freeze to death? Well, they did in a parable way. It wasn't life they lived, it was a great big creeping horror on the edge of nothing. Then this old bird, I forget his name, went up to heaven. How did he do that? Oh, the story doesn't tell. But up he went, stole the fire, and brought it down. After that they were able to open the ball we call civilization, which gives everyone a good time. How does it? Much you know. I know this much, Jenny, that I could give you a good time if you'd let me. "'You couldn't give me the good time I want. "'But I could make you want the good time I'd give you, "'which would come to the same thing. 
I imagine the folks on earth didn't think much of the fire from heaven beforehand, but once they got it, they knew what it meant to them. That's the way you'd feel, Jenny, if you'd married me. You can't begin to fancy now. On coming in sight of a line of taxicabs drawn up before her hotel, he broke off to say, Do you see those taxis, Jenny? She replied that she did. Well, one of them may mean a great deal to you and me. Which one of them? Whichever one we get into. Why should we get into it? Because, he tapped the white box in his waistcoat pocket, this little thing I've got in here wouldn't do us any good without something else. We should have to go after it together. Her mystified expression told him that she was in the dark. It's something we should have to ask for, and to, to sign. Robert Bradley Collingham, Bachelor, and Jane Scarborough Follett, Spinster. I believe that's the way it runs. Oh! The low ejaculation was just enough to show that she understood. Why shouldn't we, Jenny? It wouldn't take half an hour to get there and back. Back? She was so dazed that she echoed the word more or less unconsciously. They came in sight of a low brown tower at which he pointed with his stick. Do you see that church? Well, that church has got a parson. Quite a decent sort for a parson. How do you know? Because I talked to him about half an hour ago. I said that if he was going to be at home, we might look in on him toward the end of the afternoon. You had no right to say anything of the kind. I know I hadn't, but I took a chance. Won't you take a chance too, Jenny? It would mean the beginning of the end of all your troubles. In the long run, if not in the short run, I could take them off your hands. That she should be dead to this argument was not in human nature. Her basic conception of a man was of one who would relieve her of her burdens. Helplessness was a large part of her appeal. That marriage meant being taken care of, imparted, according to her thinking, its chief common sense to the institution. She shrank from marriage just to be taken care of. But if there was no other way, and if in this way she could bring to the family the stupendous Collingham connection in lieu of her six a week, she made up her mind to temporise. "'What makes you in such an awful hurry? We could do it any other day.' "'Did you ever see a sick man who wasn't in an awful hurry to get well?' "'You're not as bad as all that.' "'Listen, Jenny,' he said, with an ardour enhanced by her hints and relenting. "'Listen, and I'll tell you what I am. "'I'm like a chap that's been cut in two, "'who only lives because he knows the other half will be joined to him again.' "'That's all very well, but where's the other half?' "'Here.' "'He touched her lightly on the arm. "'You're the other half of me, Jenny.' I'm the other half of you. She laughed ruefully. That's news to me. I thought it might be. That's why I'm telling you. You don't suppose any other fellow would be to you what I'd be, do you? I don't know what you'd be to me, because I've so many other things to think of first. What sort of things? What your folks would say, for one. He replied with a shade of embarrassment. They say some pretty mean things to begin with. "'And to end with? "'They give in. "'They'd have to. "'Families always do when you only leave them Hobson's choice.' "'She dropped into the studio idiom. "'That wouldn't be all pie for me, would it?' "'Is anything ever all pie? "'You've got to work for your living in this old world if you want to eat. "'I'm ready to work for this, Jenny. "'I'm ready to move mountains for it, and by God I'm going to move them. "'But do you know why?' "'She said shyly. I suppose because you like me. I don't know whether I do or not. That's not what I think about first. Though they had not yet reached the line of taxicabs, he paused to make an explanation. Suppose you were inventing a machine and had got it pretty well fitted together, only that you couldn't make it work. And suppose one day you found the very part that was missing, the thing that would make it run. You know you'd have to have that one thing, wouldn't you? You'd have to have it, or your life wouldn't be worth while. I never heard any other man talk like that. Listen, Jenny, there are men and men. They go into two big bunches. To one kind, women are like whiskey, some better than others, but all good. If they can't have Mary, Susan'll do, and when they're tired of Susan, they'll run after Anne. That's one kind of fellow, and he's in the great majority. 
They're polygamous by nature, those chaps. I suppose the Lord made them so. Anyhow, as far as I can see, and I've seen pretty far, they can't help themselves. He drew a long breath. Then there's another kind. If Jenny listened with attention, it was not because she was interested in him, but in Hubert Ray. Hubert had more than once said things of the same kind. He declared male constancy to be outside the possibilities of flesh and blood, and, with her preference for cavemen, Jenny had agreed with him. That is, she had agreed with him as to every one but himself. Others could take their pleasure where and as they found it. But she could not conceive of any man loving her, or of herself loving any man, unless it was for life. On the subject of constancy or inconstancy, this was her sole reservation. "'You'll think me an awful chump, Jenny, but I'm that other kind.' She threw him a sidelong glance of some perplexity. "'You mean the kind that—' "'I'm not polygamous,' he declared, as one who confessed a criminal tendency. "'There it is, laid out flat. I'm—' He hesitated before he was using the term, lest she might not understand it. "'There's a word for my kind,' he went on tenderly. "'It's monogamous.' She made a little sound of dismay at the strangeness, it almost seemed the indecency, of the syllables. "'Yes, I thought you might never have heard of it,' he pursued in the same tender strain. "'But it means the opposite of polygamous. A polygamous guy wants to marry all the wives he can make love to. A one-wife chap like me asks for nothing so much as to be true to the girl he loves. I'm that kind, Jenny.' To his amazement, and somewhat to his joy, he saw a tear trickle down her cheek. It was a tear of regret that Hubert couldn't have expressed himself like this, but Bob thought her touched by his appeal. It encouraged him to continue with accentuated warmth. "'You've heard of what they call the Battle of the Sexes, haven't you?' She thought she had. "'Well, that's what it comes from, chiefly. The crowds of polygamous men, and the small number of polygamous women. Or else it's the crowds of monogamous women, and the small number of monogamous men.' Out of every hundred men, about ninety are polygamous, and ten want only one woman for a lifetime. Out of every hundred women, ninety are satisfied to love one man, and the other ten are rovers. Don't you see what a bad fit it makes? Yes, but how do you know I'm not one of the rovers? You couldn't be, Jenny. Even though I thought you might be, I'd be willing to take a chance. And the reason I've spun this rigmarole to you is because, if you don't take me, It'll be ten to one that you'll fall into the hands of one of the gay ninety who'll make your life a hell. I'd hate that. God, how I should hate it. Even if I didn't care anything about you, I should want to marry you, just to save you from some fancy man who'd think no more of breaking your heart than he would of smashing an eggshell. As they walked on toward the row of public conveyances, he explained himself further. On Monday next he might sail for South America but he couldn't do this leaving everything at loose ends between them. If she married him, he could go off with an easy mind, and they could keep their secret till his return. In the meanwhile, he would be able to supply her with a little cash. Not much, he was afraid, as Dad kept so tight a rubber band round the pocket-book. It would, however, be something, and he would know that she could give up her work at the studio without danger of starving to death. "'And you might as well do it first as last, Jenny,' he summed up. "'because I mean that you shall do it some time.' "'And suppose,' she objected, "'that you came back from South America in six months' time, "'and were sorry. Where should I be then?' "'He argued that this was impossible. "'A monogamous man always knew his mate "'as a monogamous bird knew his. "'It was instinct that told them both, "'and instinct never went wrong. "'They reached the row of taxis, "'and in spite of the queer looks of the passers-by, "'he took her by the hand.' "'Come, Jenny, come.' But she hung back. "'Oh, Bob, how can I, all of a sudden like this?' "'It might as well be all of a sudden as any other way, since you're my woman and I'm your man.' "'But I don't believe it.' "'Then I'll prove to you that it's so.' That he could not do this. She went with him in the end. She was not one. She was not more moved by his suit than she had been at other times. She still shrank from the scar on his brow and the touch of his tremendous hands. But she was afraid of letting him go, of dropping back into the horror of no lover in the studio and no money to bring home. 
To do this thing would save her from that emptiness, even if it led to something worse. Worse would be easier to bear than returning to nothing but a void. And so, slowly, reluctantly, with anguish in her heart, she let herself be helped into the shabby vehicle. An hour or so later, Teddy reached home. He arrived breathless, because he had run nearly all the way from the streetcar. In the empty spaces of Indiana Avenue, he felt himself conspicuous. He knew with fancy that no hint of his folly could have come to this quiet suburb, and that his theft could not possibly be discovered as yet, even by those most concerned. But he was not used to a guilty conscience. Already, in imagination, he saw himself tried, sentenced, and serving a long sentence at Bitterwell, of which he had once seen the grim grey walls. "'God, I'd shoot myself first, was his comment to himself, as he hurried past the trim grass plots where carefree men in shirt-sleeves were watering their bits of lawn. It was Pansy who first knew that something was amiss. At the sound of his hand on the doorknob she had come scampering with little silvery yelps, and had suddenly been checked by the atmosphere he threw out. Pansy knew what wrongdoing was. She knew the pangs of remorse. She had once run away from being shut up in the coal-bin, her fate when the family went to the movies, and had been lost for half a day. The agony of being adrift, and the joy of seeing Gussie come whistling and calling down the palisade walk, formed the great central escapade in Pansy's memory. For days afterward, whenever the family spoke of it, she would stand with forepaws planted apart, and head hanging dejectedly, aware that no terms could be scathing enough fully to cover her guilt. And here was Teddy in the same state of mind. Pansy had learned that the great race could suffer, but she hadn't supposed that it could get into scrapes like herself. All she could do on second thoughts was to creep forward timidly, raise herself on her hind legs, with her paws against his shin, and tell him that whatever the trouble was, she had been through it all. He paid her no attention, because, as he looked into the living-room, Gladys was seated at a table, crying, her hands covering her face. At the same time Gussie was peacocking up and down the room, saying things to her little sister that were apparently not comforting. Now that Gussie, at Madame Corinne's request, had put up her hair, her great beauty was apparent. Her face had not the guileless purity of Jenny's, but it had more intellectual vigour and much more fire. Gladys was Teddy's pet, as she was her father's. Of the three girls she was the plain one, a little red-haired, snub-nosed thing, with some resemblance to Pansy, and a heart of gold. Teddy went over and laid his hand on her fiery crown. "'Say, poor kid, little kiddie, what's the matter?' "'It's my feet,' Gladys moaned. "'And she thinks that learning the millinery at three-fifty per is all jazz and catstep,' Gussie declared grandly. "'Well, let her try it and see. She's welcome, my soul and body.' Corinne wouldn't blow her across the river when she got into a temper. I say that if you're a cash girl, you've got to take the drawbacks of a cash girl, and what's the use of kicking? If you're on your feet, you're on your feet. Rub em with oil and buck up. That's what I say. It's all very well for you to talk, spit-cat, Gladys reported. All you've got to do is to play with ribbons, as if you were dressing a doll. If you had to run like pansy every time some stut-up thing called cash— Gussie undulated her person and her outstretched arms in sheer joy of the dancing step as she strutted up and down. "'That's right, old girl. Blame it on me. I'm always the one that's in the wrong in this house. If Master Tiddy lets at last fall and breaks it, as he did last night, I push it out of his hand on purpose, though I'm in the next room. All the same, I say, buck up, and I don't care who says different. Sniffing won't cure your feet or give you a brother like Fred Ingalls, who can pay for a woman to do all the heavy work, and his mother hardly lifting a hand.' Teddy passed on to the kitchen, to see if his mother was there. She was seated at a table with a ham-bone before her, and from it was paring the last rags of the meat. He tried to take his old-time tone of gaiety. "'Hello, Ma. At it again. What are you giving us for supper? Something good, I'll bet.' Lizzie went on working without lifting her eyes. She didn't even smile. Teddy sensed something new in the way of care, as Pansy had sensed it in him. He stood at a little distance, waiting for the look that had never failed to welcome him, but which this time didn't come. "'What's the matter, Ma? Has anything gone wrong?' 
putting down the ham, Lizzie raised her eyes, though with no light in them. "'It's nothing so very wrong, dear, but I haven't told your sisters, because it's no use to worry them if— "'What is it, ma'am? Out with it.' She told him. If it was necessary to go without a hot meal between Wednesday and Saturday, of course it could be done. But even on Saturday the gas people would demand fifteen dollars on account before the gas would be turned on again. There were just two possibilities. The father might come home with the news that he found a job, or Teddy might have—she didn't believe it, but he talked of saving for a new suit of clothes—Teddy might have fifteen dollars laid away. He turned his back and walked out of the kitchen. He did it so significantly that it seemed to the mother there could be only one meaning to the act. He had saved the money and resented being robbed of it. She knew he was something of a coxcomb, and had always been proud that he could look so neat. He had only two suits, a common one and a best one, but even the common one was as brushed and pressed and stylish as if he had a valet. Nevertheless, his great activity and his love of rough-and-tumble skylarking made him hard on clothes in the sense of wear, and the common one was growing shiny at the seams and thin where there was most attrition. A new suit was an urgent necessity, that if he had a few dollars put away towards getting it, it would be no wonder if it hurt him to be asked to give them up. But Teddy had no few dollars put away. When the fund for the new suit could be counted otherwise than in pennies, some special need had always swept it into the family treasury. Teddy had let it go without a sigh. He would have let it go without a sigh to-day, only that he had nothing saved. Being naturally of a loving, caretaking disposition, it meant more to him that Gussie or Gladys should have a new pair of shoes than that he should be able to emulate Fred Ingalls in ordering a suit at Love's. Having left the kitchen, he did not go farther than the living-room, where, Gussie having taken herself upstairs, Gladys was drying her eyes. He merely walked to the end of the room, his hands in his pockets, as he stared above one of the hydrangea trees into Indiana Avenue. The windows being open, the voices of playing children mingled with the even song of birds. To Teddy there was mockery in these cheerful sounds, there was mockery in the westering May sunshine, mockery in the groups of girls, bareheaded and arm in arm, as they strolled towards Palisade Walk, mockery in the ruddy-faced men who watered their shrubs and grass, mockery in the aproned women who came to windows or doors in the intervals of preparing supper. It all spoke of a homey comfort and content, with no bluff behind it. In the Follett House all was bluff and misery. Somehow, for reasons he couldn't fathom, the cutting off of the gas from the rains seemed the last humiliation. In the matter of food, if one thing was too dear, you could eat another. So it was in the whole round of essentials in living. You could get a substitute, or you could go without. But for heat there was no substitute, and you couldn't go without it. It ranked with clothes and shelter as a necessity even among savages. And yet here they were, a civilised family, living in a civilised house, in a suburb of New York, deprived of what even micmacs could have at will. It was one of the happenings that could never have been foreseen as possibilities. His hands being in his pockets, Teddy fingered the twenty-dollar bill. He did this unconsciously merely because it was there. It did occur to him to wish it was his own, but his wishes went no farther. They had gone no farther when he swung on his heel to go back to the kitchen, he must tell his mother that he didn't have fifteen dollars put away. He hadn't done so at once, merely because his emotions had been too strong for him. He pulled his burly figure down the length of the room, as one who has to drag himself along. If he had only been Fred Ingalls, he would have handed his mother a sheaf of bills with instructions to buy all she wanted. Why couldn't he, Teddy Follett, do the same? He was, as Gussie phrased it, a great big fellow of twenty-one— and his value was only eighteen per. He proved that to, to his own satisfaction, for, in secretly trying to unearth a better place, he had been offered less than he got at Collingham and Law's. What were the shackles that bound him? Were they of his own creation, or were they forced on him by the world outside? He was as industrious as his father had been, and, except for a tendency to do his work with a broad grin, just as whole-hearted. If good intentions had commercial value, 
both father and son should have been rated high. But here was his father, a bit of old junk, while he himself, having reached man's estate, having served his country, having tacitly offered himself to the limit of his strength, was rewarded with a wage on which he could hardly live, to say nothing of helping others live. Madly, wildly, these thoughts churned in his mind as he lurched down the room towards the kitchen, while Pansy watched him with a look into which she was putting all her soul. He knew what he would say. He would say, "'Ma, it's no go. I haven't a red cent. We've got a week cold, and what cold till Saturday, anyhow. We'll not look farther ahead than that. When Saturday comes, we'll see.' But on the threshold of the kitchen he saw something which brought a new sensation. In free fights while in the Navy he had thought he had seen red, but he had never seen red like this. He had never supposed it possible that this torrent of wrath, tenderness, and pity should rise within himself, a fountain spouting at the same time both sweet water and bitter. His mother was seated at the table crying. The ham bone was before her, the rags of meat on the plate, and the knife on top of them. But she, like Gladys a few minutes previously, had covered her face with her hands while her shoulders rocked. In all his twenty-one years Teddy had never seen his mother cry. He had cried, the girls had cried, his father had very nearly cried, but his mother never. The strong spirit had grieved in strong ways, but not in this way. Now it seemed as if all the griefs she had laid up since the days when she was Lizzie Scarborough had heaped themselves to the point at which these strange, harsh, unnatural tears were their only assuagement. Teddy was down on his knees beside her, his arms flung round her neck. "'Ma, good old Ma, dear old Ma, don't cry. For God's sake, don't cry. Stop crying, Ma!' he shouted in an imploring passion as strange, harsh, and unnatural as her own. "'Here's the money I've saved for my new clothes. Take it and go and pay something on the gas bill. There, there. Stop, for God's sake, for your little boy's sake. I love you, Ma. Only stop. There. That's better. Calm down, Ma.' Everything will be all right, and I'll, I'll get the new clothes by and by. But in his heart he was saying, To hell with Collingham and Laws, as he laid the bill before her. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 8 Jenny cried herself to sleep that Wednesday night, and in the morning cried herself awake. She was in no doubt as to the motive of her tears. She was sorry for having put a gulf between her and the man she loved by marrying one she didn't care for. Why she didn't care for him was beyond her power of analysis. He was good and kind and tender, he was rock-like and steady and strong, in a forceful way he was almost handsome, and some day he would be rich. But there was the fact that, her heart being given to the one man, her nerves shuddered at the other. The explanation she used to give, that the lividness of the scar on his forehead frightened her, was no longer tenable, since the mark tended to fade out. The other infirmity, his limp, was also less conspicuous, for though he could never walk as if his foot had not been crushed, he walked as well as many other men. It wasn't these peculiarities. It wasn't any one thing in itself. It was simply that she didn't love him, and never would. Whereas she did love another man. She loved his violet eyes, his brown moustache, his flashing teeth, his selfishness, his cruelty. She loved his system of starving her out, his habit of keeping her in anguish. Too much reasonableness was hard for her to assimilate, like so much water to a portulaca. And Bob had been so reasonable, he had tried to explain himself, he had used words that scared, that shocked her. Polygamous, monomagous, the very sound suggested anatomy or impropriety. Nevertheless, she could have pardoned this language as an eccentricity, if, in the dimness of the parson's hall, he hadn't taken her in his arms, and kissed her. This possibility was something she forgot when she followed him up the rectory's brownstone steps. 
for the inadvertence she blamed herself the more, since through the winter she had never once lost sight of it. Whenever he had proposed to her, the advantages of marrying so much money had been offset by her terror at his pawing her about. With no high-flown ideas as to virtue, Jenny would have fought like a wildcat for her virginity of mind and body, till ready of her own free will to give them up. And here she had sold herself to Bob Collingham, a man whose touch made her shrink. "'I can't live with you,' she cried, as she tore herself from his embrace. And poor Bob had been reasonable again. "'Of course not, Jenny, darling. Not yet. When I come back—' She hadn't let him finish. She dashed through the doors and down the steps, so that he had some ado to keep up with her. Even then, he had only dragged her away and been a caveman. And the evening at home had been one of the oddest she had ever spent under her father's roof. Everyone was so queer. Or else she was queer herself. Gussie and Gladys, reconciled after their squabble, had both been in high spirits, and Teddy almost hysterical. He gave imitations of the men with whom he worked most closely at the bank, of Fred Ingalls, of Mrs. Ingalls, of Dolly, Addie, and Sadie Ingalls, which made everyone feel that a great actor was being lost to the stage. But on top of these exhibitions he would fall into spells of profound reverie. The father had been apathetic, but he was always apathetic now. The mother, on the other hand, more serene than usual. More than usual, too, her eyes applauded Teddy's high spirits with a quiet, adoring smile. Altogether the supper had been a merry one, and yet, to Jenny's thinking, merry with a mysterious note in the merriment, a note which perhaps only Pansy's intuitions could have really understood. But, sitting on the edge of her bed in the morning, she saw a ray of hope. There was divorce. Marriage wasn't the irreparable thing which their family's traditions assumed it to be. As a tolerably diligent reader of the personal items in the papers, Jenny had more than once read of divorces granted to young couples who had parted at the church door. Naturally, she shrank from the fuss it would involve, but better the fuss than... Having got up, for the reason that she couldn't stay in bed, she dressed slowly, because none of the family was as yet astir. She would surprise her mother by lighting the gas range and making the coffee before anyone came down. Thus it happened that she saw the postman crossing the street with a letter in his hand. The letters were not rare in the family. They were rare enough to make the arrival of one an incident. She went to the door to take it from the postman's hand. Seeing it addressed to Miss Follett, and bearing the postmark Marillo, her knees trembled under her. Having read what Mrs. Collingham had written, Jenny's first thought was that her early rising enabled her to keep this missive secret. What it could pretend was beyond her surmise. It was not unfriendly, but neither was it cordial. It took the guarded tone, she thought, of a woman who meant to see her face to face before being willing to commit herself. As success on meeting people face to face had mostly been Jenny's portion, she was not so much afraid of the test as of what it might bring afterward. What it might bring afterward was the recognition of her marriage and her translation into a rich family. This would mean the end of her father's and mother's material cares, Teddy's advancement at the bank, and brilliant careers for Gussie and Gladys in New York social life. Jenny could think of at least half a dozen picture plays in which the sacrifice of some lovely, virtuous girl had done as much as this for her relatives. So, all that day, sacrifice as much in her mind. Against a vague background of grandeur, it had the same emotional effect as of passion sung to the accompaniment of a great orchestra. To see herself with a limousine at her command, and the family established in a modest villa somewhere out near Mirillo Park, if not quite within it, enabled her mentally to face another embrace from Bob in the spirit of an early Christian maiden thinking of the lions awaiting her in the arena. It would be terrible, but it could be met. The vision of the limousine at her command seemed to have come partly true as a trim chauffeur stepped up to her in the station at Marillo, touching his cap and asking if he spoke to Miss Follett. He touched his cap again when he closed the door on her, and the car tooled away along a road which bore the same relation to the roads with which Jenny was familiar as a glorified spirit to a living man. The park was not so much a park as it was a country. 
It had hills, valleys, landscapes, lakes, and what seemed to Jenny immense estates for which there was plenty of room. There were houses as big as hotels, and much more beautiful. Trees, flowers, lawns, terraces, fountains, tennis courts, dogs, horses, and motor cars were as silver in the building of the Temple of Jerusalem. Nothing accounted of. Jenny had seen high life as lived by the motion picture herein, but he had not believed that even wealth could buy such a garden of Eden as this. Expecting to reach Collingham Lodge a few minutes after passing the grill, she had gone on and on, over roads that branched, and then branched, and then branched again, like the veinings of a leaf. After descending at the white cotton to portico, she went up the steps in a state bordering on trance. She knew what to do, much as Elijah, having come by the chariot of fire to another plane of life, must have known what to do when required to get out and go onward. Since a man in livery opened a door of wrought-iron tracery over glass, she had no choice but to pass through. It is possible that Max, by his supersenses, knew that she belonged to his master, for, springing towards her, he nosed her hand. It was as she put it to herself, the only human touch in the first stages of her welcome. Thenceforward, during all the forty or fifty minutes of her stay, he kept close to her, either on foot or crouched beside her chair, till a curious thing happened when she regained the car. I have said in the first stages of her welcome, for as soon as she entered the hall she heard a cheery voice. "'Oh, so it's you, Miss Follett, so glad you've come,' "'It's really too bad to bring you so far, "'only it seemed to me we might be cosy here "'than if I went up to town.' "'Down the golden space, "'which seemed to Jenny much too majestic "'for any one's private dwelling, "'a brisk figure moved with hand outstretched. "'A few seconds later Jenny was looking into eyes "'such as she didn't suppose existed in human faces. "'Beauty, dignity, poise, "'white hair dressed to perfection, "'and clothes such as Jenny had never seen off the stage.' and rarely on it, were all subordinated to a hearty, kindly, womanly greeting before they sank out of sight. Overpowered as she was by the material costliness of all she saw, the girl was well-nigh crushed by this unaffected affability. Like the Queen of Sheba at the court of Solomon, to be scriptural again, there was no more spirit left in her. Mrs. Collingham went on talking as, side by side, they walked slowly up the strip of red carpet into the cool recesses of the house. "'I hope you didn't find the train too stuffy. It's too bad they won't give us a parlour car on the locals. For the last three or four years we only have a parlour car on what they call the husband's trains, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And, my dear, they make us pay for it as if—' A toss of the hands proved to Jenny that Mrs. Collingham knew the difference between cheap and dear, which again took her by surprise. They passed through the terrace drawing-room, which Jenny couldn't notice because she trod on air, and came out to the flagged pavement. Even here Mrs. Collingham didn't pause, but, leading the way to the end of it, she went round a corner to the northern and more private side of the house, which looked into a little wood. "'Mr. Collingham's at home, just driven down, but I'm not going to have him here. Men are such a nuisance when women talk about intimate things, don't you think? They make such mountains of mill-hills.' just as when you have a cry. They think your heart must be breaking, and never seem to understand that it gives you some relief. Jenny was still more astounded. That the mistress of Collingham Lodge, a great figure in Murillo Park, and therefore high up in the peerage of the United States, could have the same feelings as herself, seemed the touch of nature that makes the whole world kin to a degree she had put beyond the limits of the human heart. They came to construction like a giant bird-cage, a room out of doors, yet sheltered from noisome insects like their own screened piazza, furnished with an outdoor indoor luxury. We don't have many mosquitoes at Murillo, Mrs. Collingham explained as she led the way in, but in spring they can be troublesome, so we'll have our tea here. Gossip will bring it presently. Where will you sit? I think you'll like that chair. There, what about a cushion? Oh, I'm sure you don't need it at your age, but still one likes to be comfortable. "'No, Max, stay out.' "'Well, if you must come in, come in. "'He seems to like you,' she chatted on. "'He's Bob's dog, and I suppose he takes to Bob's friends.' 
rendered speechless by this frank reference to the man who was the bond between them, there was, fortunately, no immediate need for Jenny to speak, since gossip appeared in the doorway pushing the tea equipage. It was a little table on wheels, and on it Jenny noticed, in a general way, every magnificent detail. The silver tray, the silver kettle, the silver teapot, the silver tongs, the silver spoons. "'And all of them solid,' she said to herself awesomely. She regretted that she wouldn't be at liberty to recount these marvels at home. At home they thought her merely at the studio, while she had been borne away through the air as by a witch on a broomstick. Jenny would have said that Mrs. Collingham had hardly looked at her, but then, she reflected, every woman knew how little looking you had to do to grasp the details of another woman's personality. You took them all in at a glance, as if you brought seven or eight senses into play. Each time her hostess, now settled behind the tea-table, lifted her fine eyes, Jenny was sure they got her like a camera. "'You pose, don't you?' The words came out in a casual, friendly tone as she busied herself with the spirit lamp. "'That must be so interesting. I often wonder, when I'm in the big galleries, what the immortal women would have said had they known how their features would go down through the ages. Take Dorothea Nachtigall, for instance, the original of Holbein's Mayor Madonna in Darmstadt, the most wonderful of all the Madonnas, I always say. And how queer, I suppose, she would have felt if she'd known that we would be adoring her when she's no more than a handful of dust.' or the model who posed for the Madonna di San Sisto, or the young things who sat to Grotza. Did you ever think of them? Jenny saw how Bob could have come by words like polygamous and monogamous. People at Marillo Park spoke a language of their own. English with frills on it, was the way she put it to herself. From the intonation she was able to frame her answer in the negative, while, once more, the superb eyes, which were oddly like Bob's little steely ones, were lifted on her with a smile. "'You know, I should think people would be crazy to paint you. How do you like your tea? Sugar? Cream? One lump? Two lumps?' Having flung out answers at random, Jenny leaned forward to take her cup, while the kindly voice rang on. "'Just as you sit there, you're a picture. "'Funny I should have given you a tan-coloured cushion, because it tones in exactly.' Jenny explained that the various shades of brown and some of the deeper ones of red were among her favourites. "'Because they go so well with your hair,' her hostess said comprehendingly, and studying her now more frankly. "'My dear, you've got the most lovely hair. It isn't auburn, it isn't coppery, it isn't red, it's—' "'What is it? Oh, I see, it's, it's amber. It's the extraordinary shade Romney gets into some of his portraits of Lady Hamilton. You see it in the one in the Frick Gallery, if I remember rightly.' "'You must look the next time you're there.' "'Jenny tried to stammer that she would, "'only that her syllables ran into one another and became incoherent. "'But Romney couldn't paint you,' Mrs. Collingham declared enthusiastically, "'putting her cup to her lips. "'He's too Georgian. You're the twentieth century. "'You're the perfect spirit of the age, "'restless, rebellious, wistful, and delicate all at once. "'Girls nowadays remind me of exquisite, fragile things— like this part of the Sainte Chapelle, only built of steel. You've got the steel look, all slender and unbendable. It's curious that the way women look like the ages in which they're born. You've only to go through a portrait collection to see that it's so. Take the Stuart women, for instance, the, the Van Dyke and the Lely women. Great saucer-eyed things with sensual lips and breasts. And then the Holbein women, so terribly got up in their stiff Sunday clothes, which they must have hurried to put into their cedar chest the minute they got home from Mass. But they belong to their time, don't you think? Jenny could only say she did think, vowing in her heart that the next day would see her going round the Metropolitan Museum with a catalogue. But you! Hubert Ray says he's done a wonderful study of you, and I'm crazy to see it. The only thing I don't like from his description is that he's got you in a Greek dress and attitude— and I think, now that I've seen you, that the day after to-morrow is your style. What do you say yourself? I don't know about the day after to-morrow. I'm, I'm so busy with to-day. Mrs. Collingham took this with a pleasant little laugh. <laughs> you clever thing! You won't give yourself away. She mused a few seconds, a smile on her lips, 
and then said with a sudden lifting of the eyes, "'What do you think of Bob?' The girl could only stammer, Th "'Think of him? I in what way? Do you think he looks like me?' In this rapid, unexpected shifting of the ground, Jenny was like a giddy person trying to keep her head. "'Well, yes, in, in a way, only—' Mrs. Collingham laughed again. "'I see that, too. He does. I can't deny it. Often when I look at him I see myself only—you'll laugh, I know—only myself as I've been reflected in the back of a silver spoon. That's the trouble with Bob. He's so unformed. You must have noticed it. I suppose it's the war, and yet I don't know. He's always been like that. A dear fellow, but no more than half-grown. I dare say, but by the time he's fifty he'll be something like a man. As there seemed to be no absolute need for a response to this, Jenny waited for more. It came, after another little spell of musing. "'He's talked to me so much about you all through the winter. That's why I asked you to come down. Mr. Collingham and I feel so tremendously indebted to you for the way you've acted.' Jenny could only repeat feebly, "'The way I've acted? I mean the way you've understood him. Almost any other girl. Yes, girls right here in Murillo Park would have taken him at his word.' Jenny's lips were parted, but unable to frame a question. Mrs. Collingham eyed the spirit lamp. "'All the same, that doesn't excuse him. Even a fellow who isn't half-grown should have more sense than to make love to every girl he spends an hour with. One of these days some girl will catch him, and then he'll be sorry. That's why we've been so thankful for the kind of influence you've had over him, and why my husband and I thought we'd like to, to do something—well, something a little— audacious. Jenny was twisting her fingers and untwisting them, but luckily her hostess, by keeping her eyes on the spirit lamp, didn't notice this sign of nervousness. Once more she spoke, with a musing half-smile. We, we see a good deal of someone else who keeps talking about you, and you won't mind, will you? Of course we've drawn our conclusions. We couldn't help that, could we, when they were staring us in the face? "'Do you mean Mr. Ray?' Jenny asked, with the point-blank helplessness of one who doesn't know how to hedge. "'Oh, I, I didn't use the name, now, did I? And as I've said, what we've seen, we've seen, and we couldn't help it. But, of course, if it hadn't been for Bob, we shouldn't have seen so quickly.' "'But he doesn't know,' Jenny cried, more as a query than as affirmation. "'No, I suppose he doesn't. I, I only mean that, as you refused Bob so many times—he told me that— we naturally thought there must be someone else, and, and when everything pointed that way, and Hubert had talked of you so much. She kept this line of reasoning suspended, while once more she shifted her ground suddenly. I wonder if you've ever realised how hard it is to show your gratitude towards people to whom you're truly and deeply feeling grateful. Jenny mumbled something to the effect that she'd never been in that situation. Well, it is a situation— People are so queer and proud and difficile. I suppose it's we older people who run up oftenest against that. But if Mr. Collingham and I could only do for people the things we might do, and which they won't let us do— Once more the idea was suspended, to give Jenny time to take in the fact that a good thing was coming her way. But all she could manage was to stare with frightened, fascinated eyes, and no power of thought. "'Do you know, my dear,' the artless voice ran on, "'now that I'm face to face with you, I'm really afraid. "'I told my husband that if he'd leave us alone together I shouldn't be, "'and after all I am.' "'She leaned forward confidentially. "'How frank would you let me be? "'How much would you be willing for me to say?' But "'Before the girl could invent a reply, "'the voice kept up its even, caressing measure.' I know how things are with you. At least, I think I do. I've been young, my dear. I know what it is to be in love. You're colouring, but you needn't do it. Not for me. You're very much in love, aren't you? Jenny bowed her head to hide her tears. She hadn't meant to admit how much in love she was, but this sympathy unnerved her. You do love Hubert, don't you? Yes, but— "'And that's why you told Bob you couldn't marry him?' "'That's one of the reasons, but—' 
"'One of the reasons will do, my dear. "'You don't know how much I feel with you and for you. "'I could tell you a little story about myself when I was your age, "'but, but then old love-tales are like dried flowers. "'They've lost their scent and colour. "'Mr. Collingham and I are very fond of Hubert, "'and, of course, he doesn't make enough to marry on, as things are now. "'He has a little something, I suppose, "'and with the work he's doing the future is secure.' You'll find one day that he'll be painting you as Andrea del Sarto painted Lucrezia, and Rembrandt Saskia, and their wives, you know. Oh, but Mrs. Collingham, there, there, my dear, I'm not going to say anything more about that. I know Hubert and what he wants, and so my husband and I thought that if we could show our gratitude to you and make things easier for him. Oh, but you couldn't. We couldn't unless you helped us. "'That goes without saying, of course, but we hoped you would. "'You see, when people have so much, "'not that we're so tremendously rich, but when they have enough, "'and when they know, as we do, what struggle is, "'and there's been anyone whom they admire, as, as we admire you, "'after all you've done for Bob, "'we thought that if we could give a little present, a, "'a wedding present it would be, "'only just a little in anticipation, "'we thought five thousand dollars.' She ceased suddenly, because Jenny appeared as one transfixed. She sat erect, but the life seemed to have gone out of her. Mrs. Collingham was prepared for this. She had discounted it in advance. "'She's playing for more,' she said to herself. Luckily she had named her minimum only, and had arranged with her husband for a maximum. The maximum was all the same to her so long as she saved Bob.' Having given Jenny credit for seeing through the game all along, such girls were quick and astute. She had expected that the first figure of the present would meet with just this reception. But Jenny was saying to herself, oh, "'This kind offer had only come yesterday!' Five thousand dollars was a sum of which she could not see the spending limitations. It meant all of which the family had need, and that she herself had ever coveted. With five thousand dollars she could not only have put her father on his feet, but have come before Hubert as an heiress. Mrs. Collingham said at last, with a shade of coldness in her tone, "'I should be willing to make it seven or, or ten. Perhaps we'd better say ten at once and enter the discussion. My husband's willing to make it ten, but I don't think he'd give more. Our son is very dear to us.' The reality seeped through in spite of her attempts at comedy. Uh, "'Oh, Miss Follett, if you only help us to keep him for ourselves, of you've helped us already.' Jenny staggered to her feet. Her arms hung lax at her side. Ten thousand dollars! The sum was fabulous. It would have meant all cares lifted from the home. And Hubert! She was hardly aware of her speaking as she said, "'Oh, Mrs. Collium, I can't take your money. I wish I could.' "'My God, how I wish I could, but—but—but but, but for goodness' sake, child, why can't you? "'Because—oh, because—I'm married to Bob already.'" End of chapter 8「Nine of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. CHAPTER Nine. It was one of those occasions when the auditory nerve seems to connect imperfectly with the brain. Mrs. Collingham placed her cup on the table and leaned forward, puzzled, tense. "'What did you say? Sit down. Tell me that again.' Jenny collapsed against the tan cushion of the chair and repeated her confession. Her hostess's brows knitted painfully. "'But I don't understand. When did you marry him?' The girl explained that it had been on the previous afternoon. But, but, but you said just now that you were in love with someone else. So I am. Only, only Bob made me. Made you what? Made me go and get a license and marry him. He said— Her lips and tongue were so parched that it was hard to form the words. He said he was going away in a few days to South America, and that he couldn't go unless he knew I was his wife. I begged him to let me off, but he, he, he wouldn't. Oh, Mrs. Collium, what am I to do? The appeal helped Junior to rally her stricken powers. It enabled her to say inwardly, I must act through this girl herself. 
If I estrange her, I may lose my son. A flash of the lioness wrath with which she trembled might lead to an irretrievably false step. So she made her tone kindly, sympathetic, almost affectionate. And Bob? Does he know that, that you care for someone else? He never asked me. But don't you think you should have told him? That's not so very easy when— "'But there was some sort of understanding between you and Hubert, wasn't there?' "'Jenny's only answer to this was to clasp her hands and say, "'Oh, Mrs. Collium, how do people get divorces?' "'This being more than Junior had hoped for, "'she tried to use the opening to the best of her ability. "'They, they do something that, that makes the other person want to be free.' Trying to explain this further, she ran the risk of citing a case perhaps too close to the point. Oh, for instance, if my husband wanted to be free, he'd do something that would make me willing to divorce him. And would you? You see, I'm taking the case of his wanting to be free. In that situation, he's the one who would do the thing. If I wanted to be free, I suppose, I suppose I should do it. So that if I wanted to be free... It would be up to me to do the thing rather than up to Bob. A moral issue being here at stake, Jeanie was obliged, in the expressive American phrase, to sidestep, though she supposed that the suggestion in the air was of no more than Jenny had done already. As an artist's model it would be part of her professional occupation. I'm not giving you advice, my dear. I'm only trying to answer your question— "'I'm so sorry for you that I'd do anything I could to help you unravel the triangle.' "'Then you think there are ways of unravelling it?' "'Oh, certainly, if you are willing to.' "'To what, Mrs. Collingham? There's almost nothing I wouldn't do to get us all out when you've been so kind to me.' Having a conscience of her own, Junior continued to sidestep. "'My dear, I can't tell you what to do. I'm not sure that I know very well. You see, it's your trouble, and—' "'You must get out of it. "'I'll help you. "'I will do that. "'In every way I can, I'll make it easy for you, "'but I couldn't advise or, or, or put anything in your way "'that might be considered as, as temptation.' "'But conscientious scruples were not in Jenny's line. "'When eager to reach a point, she went to it straight. "'If Bob came back from South America "'and found I was living with Hubert, "'wouldn't he have to divorce me then?' Julia rose in the agitation of one unused to plain talk, and shocked by it. "'Jenny? Your name is Jenny, isn't it? I must go and speak to Mr. Collingham. You'll stay here, won't you, till I come back? I may have something, then, rather important to say.' The girl sat still, looking up adoringly. "'Are you going to tell him?' "'No, I think not. But there's something I want to ask him. I don't think that either you or I had better say anything to anyone.' "'What do you think?' Jenny shook her head. "'I don't want to. I wish nobody would ever have to know.' "'I wish Hubert didn't have to know. Perhaps he won't. And yet, let us think.' She dropped into a chair nearer to Jenny than the one behind the tea-table. "'One thing I must ask you. What happened after you and Bob went through that ceremony yesterday afternoon?' "'Nothing happened. He motored back to his friends on Long Island, and I took the ferry and went home.' He said he'd see me on Saturday to say good-bye. Where? Oh, I don't know. In Central Park, I expect. He's asked me to meet him there once or twice already. But I wouldn't go anywhere else with him, if I were you. Not into our house or anything. I won't if he doesn't make me. I'd be firm about that. You see, if you did, well, I'm sure you understand it, it might, it, it might make it harder for you to find your way out to where you'd be happy again. Are you sure you see what I mean? I've had that out with him. He said that nothing would happen till he got back from South America. Relieved by this simple statement, Junior went on. And if I were you, I wouldn't say a word to anybody, not even to your own father and mother. Your mother is living, isn't she? Don't even tell Bob that you've seen me. Don't tell anyone anything. Let it be your secret and mine. I want you to feel that I'm your friend— and anxious to help you out of the muddle in which you've tied up your happiness. At first, when you told me, I thought more of Hubert. But now that we've talked, I'm thinking of you too, and how much I should like to see you. A dim smile conveyed the rest of the thought, while she rose again. Now I'll go. 
Don't be alarmed if I'm a little long. Max will take care of you. Left to herself, Jenny's emotions came in waves of conflicting calculation. Had she only been in love with Bob, and not with Hubert, all this graciousness would have lapped her round in silk and softness. Nothing would have been denied her from a limousine to pearls. There would have been the villa for the family, with Gussie and Gladys turned into buds. But, as an offset to it, there would be the renunciation. Somehow, since cutting herself away from Hubert by the ceremony with Bob, he seemed nearer to her than before. Things she had supposed to be out of the question now presented themselves as more in the line of those that could be done. Within twenty-four hours she had lived much. She had ripened much. Now that she had had this talk with Mrs. Collingham, Hubert became more definitely an alternative. She could choose him and let this wealth and beauty go, or she could choose the wealth and beauty and let him... But at the thought of turning her back on him, something seemed to choke her. To choose what money could buy, instead of this great love, was treachery to all she knew as sublime. She clutched herself over the heart. It was as if she were going to die. Max was so startled that he sprang upon her with his mighty paws in the roughness of young consternation. On the other hand, home conditions were well-nigh imperative. Love and Hubert were all very well, but they were part of the world of romance. The family, with their concrete needs, were actuality. Jenny thought of each one of them in turn, but of Teddy most of all. Among those of her own generation, he was her favourite. If she became openly Mrs. Robert Bradley Collingham, Jr., of Marillo Park, Teddy would go far. He might have a place like Mr. Brunt's. Only the other day her father had said of Mr. Brunt, "'There's one who don't have any trouble in picking down his ten a week.' To see Teddy pickling down his ten a week, which would be more than five hundred dollars in a year, Jenny was ready to submit to almost anything, even Bob's hands on her person. She might get used to them, and if she didn't, why, the daily sacrifice would be not without its reward. She reached something like this decision when Mrs. Collingham came back. Watching her from the minute when she rounded the corner of the flagged pavement, Jenny noted a rapid change in her expression. At first it was terrible, that of a queen in wrath. As she approached the birdcage, however, it cleared so quickly that by the time she reached the threshold it was almost tender. "'That's because she likes me,' Jenny said to herself. She was accustomed to being liked, though especially by men. "'I think it will cheer her up if I say right off that I've come to stay with her.' To make this announcement, she had risen to her feet with lips already parted, but Mrs. Collingham forestalled her. "'Sit down again, my dear. I want to talk to you some more. I must tell you about Mr. Collingham.' She herself sank into the chair near Jenny, which she had already occupied. She panted, as after a difficult experience. "'Oh, dear, it's been so trying. You don't know him, do you? Well, he's a good man, kind and just in his way, but... Oh, so stern and relentless. If he knew what Bob had done in going through that mad thing with you, he'd turn the boy adrift. Having reseated herself already, Jenny now closed her lips. She had forgotten Mr. Collingham. Coming to stay was meeting a new obstacle. It's only fair of you to make you understand what kind of man my husband is. Of course, he's a strong man, otherwise he wouldn't have accomplished all he has. My son, my daughter, I myself were, but puppets on his string. His word has to be law to us. And with Bob, the way he is, wanting to marry every girl he meets and forgetting her next day, his father has no patience. You don't know how hard it is for me, my dear, always to have to stand between them. As she paused to dab her eyes, Jenny saw the limousine, the villa, with Teddy's chance of pickling down ten a week, fading out like a picture in the movies. "'I wouldn't dare to tell him of the great wrong Bob has done to you. He'd disinherit him on the spot. If Bob were to insist on having this escapade, you wouldn't really call it a marriage, would you? But if he were to insist on its being made public, why, there'd be an end of his relations with his father. My husband would never give him a cent, nor leave him a cent. I must say that Bob would deserve it, but, Jenny, I'm thinking of you.' You'd have forsaken the man you loved, 
married a man you didn't care for and got nothing in the world to show for it. That's where you'd have to suffer, and I could see well enough that you're suffering already. There was every reason now that Jenny's tears should begin to flow. Flow they did, while her companion watched. And yet, as you see, Mr. Collingham is not an unkind man. When I explained to him that we might be more indebted to you than I had thought at first, he said, with a look of anticipation, Jenny stopped crying suddenly, though the tears already shed were glistening on her cheek. The point was now to find phraseology at once clear enough and delicate enough to suggest a course, and yet not shock the sensibilities. "'You see, my dear, it's this way. One has to keep one's ideals, hasn't one? That goes without saying. Once we let our ideals go—' She flung her hands outward. "'Well, what's the use of living?' "'My own life hasn't been as happy as you might think. "'And if it hadn't been for my ideals—' "'Jenny broke in because she couldn't help it. "'Mr. Ray is ideal for a man, don't you think, Mrs. Collingham?' "'It was the lead Junior needed. "'He's perfect, Jenny, in his way. "'I know how I wish you were as free as forty-eight hours ago. "'You could be, of course, if—' "'But I mustn't advise you, must I? "'I don't know how to. "'I'm just as lost as you are.' "'Only, if you could find a way to cast the burden of the whole thing on Bob. "'Do you mean to make him get the divorce?' "'In that case we should want to feel that you had something to fall back upon. "'And so my husband thought that perhaps twenty-five thousand dollars?' "'Jenny gave a great gasp. "'Her head began to swim. "'Not villas and limousines rose before her, "'but cloud-capped towers and gorgeous palaces. "'Poor Daddy,' she thought, wouldn't have to hunt for a job any more, and Mama would have nothing to do for the rest of her life but sit in a chair and rock. Yet that was only part of the vision. The rest did not go so easily into words. She had only to hurry to the studio, fling herself into the arms she was longing to feel clasped around her, and become fabulously rich. That would be if Bob took the opening she offered him. If he didn't, "'But suppose Bob won't?' she asked, in terror, lest he should not. "'I've thought of that, too,' came the prompt answer. "'He will, of course, but suppose he didn't. "'Well, we're not haggless, my dear. "'We're only simple people trying to do right, "'just as you're trying to do right yourself. "'If Bob is only in a position in which he can undo his wrong, "'whether he undoes it or not, "'you shall have your twenty-five thousand just the same. "'Could I have it as early as, uh, as next week?' "'If the conditions are fulfilled, certainly.' Jenny was anxious to free herself from the charge of cupidity. "'The reason I say next week is that my father is worried about the interest on the mortgage and the taxes. He didn't pay the interest last time, and the taxes are two months overdue. If he can't find the money by next week, you yourself can be in a position to take all the worry off his hands once the conditions are fulfilled.' Little more was said after this. There was little more to say. The necessities of the case being once understood, Junior steered her guest back to the car, which waited at the door. But into the leave-taking, Max threw an odd note of hostility. As if he resented some baseness towards his master, he pressed his flank against Jenny with such force as almost to knock her down. And when she sprang away from him into the car, he growled after her. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 10 So you can do it and get away with it. This was Teddy's reflection as he left the bank on that Thursday afternoon. He'd spent an infernal day, but it was over, and over safely. Of the missing twenty dollars he had neither heard a word nor caught a sign of anxiety. Mr. Brunt had been methodical and taciturn as usual. Always keeping a gulf between Teddy and himself, it was neither more nor less a gulf to-day than it was on other days. As to whether he missed twenty dollars, or whether he did not, Teddy could form no idea. In the middle of the morning there had been a terrifying incident. "'See that guy over there?' Lobley, one of his colleagues, had asked him. 
He saw the guy over there, a crafty, clean-shaven kilt, and said so. "'That's Flynn, the detective who copped Nicholson, the teller of the Wyndham International.' "'Oh, my God, I'm pinched!' Teddy exclaimed to himself. "'If I had a gun or a dose of poison, he'd never get me alive.' But Flynn only chatted with Jackman, one of the house detectives, laughed, cashed a cheque at a wicket, and left the bank. Teddy breathed again, wondering if he'd given anything away to Lobley. Was it possible that Lobley could have heard of the twenty dollars and been set to try him out? No, he didn't believe so. Lobley had merely pointed out Flynn as a notable character, and gone about his business. "'I shall never forget that mug,' Teddy thought, as he summoned his sang froid to go on with his work. "'The mug of a guy without guts,' he added, further to define the pitiless set of Flynn's features. "'I sure would kill myself before I let him touch me.' There was no other alarm that day. There was only the incessant fear, the incessant watchfulness, that made him shrink from every eye that danced his way, and which, when off his hours were over, sent him scuttling to the subway like a rabbit to its hole. At supper his father brought up again the subject of the taxes and the interest on the mortgage. The latter would be due at the end of the following week, and the former was long overdue. With the added interest on both, he owed two hundred and sixty-odd dollars, of which he had borrowed from old friends a hundred and fifteen. Between the sum due and that in hand, there was a gap which he didn't see how to fill. "'We'll get it somehow, Daddy,' Jenny said encouragingly. "'Don't begin worrying.' "'No, Ted'll rob the bank,' Gussie laughed flippantly. Teddy was on his feet, shaking his fist across the table. "'See here, Miss Gus, that's just about—' Gussie laughed up at him, still more flippantly. "'You haven't robbed it already, have you? Mamma, do make him behave.' "'Children, don't squabble, please. Teddy, darling, Gussie was only poking a little fun. Sit down and have some more hash. It's made with beets in it, just the way you like it. I was reading,' she continued, to divert the minds of the company, "'of that teller at the Wyndham National.' Nicholson, Josiah put in. I used to know him when I was at the Hudson River Trust. Sharp eyed little ferret face he was. Twenty three thousand, extending over a period of five years. Often had lunch with him at the same counter. Blueberry pie was a favourite of his. Twenty three thousand, extending over a period of five years. Teddy repeated that to himself. He wondered that it hadn't struck him when he heard the fellows at the bank discussing the arrest. One of them had claimed inside dope as to how Nicholson had covered up his tracks, and explained the process. Teddy hadn't listened to that, because the magnitude of the theft had excluded its bearing on his own. But there it was, forcing itself on his attention, like Pansy's cold nose pressed at that minute against his hand. You could have five years' leeway, and never be suspected. He pumped his father for further details as to Nicholson's life, learning that he'd owned his house at Leffingwell Manor, where he'd been a member of the golf club and a churchgoer. At his own fears, Teddy smiled inwardly. Twenty dollars which would certainly be paid back in the course of a few weeks. Already he'd saved seventy cents towards the restoration, just by going without his lunch, with a few economies in car fares. If he could pawn his best suit of clothes, he would have the whole sum within a fortnight. The suit had been bought for twenty-six dollars, and would certainly bring in ten. It would be a matter of dodging his mother and getting it out of the closet in her room, where she kept it in order to regulate his use of it. As supper went on, it was little Gladys who brought up the question which someone older might have asked. "'What would happen, Daddy, if you couldn't pay the interest and the taxes?' "'They could sell us out of house and home.' But this possibility being more than a week off, the statement brought no fears with it. Like all people who at the best of times are dependent on a weekly wage, the Follets had the mental attitude best described as from hand to mouth. That is, once the dinner was secure, there was no will to worry as to where the supper was to come from. It was fundamentally a question of outlook. People used to being provided for naturally looked ahead. But where your most extended view could take you no more than from one meal to another, your powers of forecast grew limited. Doubtless the provision was merciful, for, in the case of the Follets, even the parents felt the futility of dreading a calamity more than a week away. Of all the six, Jenny was the only one with the power of making comparisons and drawing contrasts. She had had, that day, a glimpse of a world as different from her own as paradise from earth. 
It was no use saying that it was different only in degree. It was different also in kind. It was different in values, in textures, in amplitudes. It was another thing, not another aspect of the same thing. Junior Collingham might be a human being like herself, but in all that was of practical account, she was as widely separated from Jenny Follett as a New Yorker from a Central African. That was as far as Jenny got. Her mind was not given to deduction or her spirit to asking questions. Not having a god in particular, she had nothing to act as a great touchstone to praise or to blame. Some human beings had everything, others had next to nothing. The Follets were among the others. Jenny didn't know how or why, she didn't ask to know. Knowing would perhaps be worse than not knowing, since it might stir rebellion where now there was only lassitude and resignation. But there was the fact. The Colliums could throw her twenty-five thousand dollars, as she threw a titbit to Pansy, while her father might be sold out of the house and home for lack of a hundred and fifty. Jenny mused, but she did no more. Life was too big a mystery to grapple with. If she tried it, it made her unhappy. It made her unhappy that Max should have been friendly at first, and then growled at her so resentfully. She wondered if dogs had a scent for moral and emotional atmospheres. She couldn't express this last in words, but she did it very well by thought. She often had thoughts for which she had no words, so that her inner life was broader than that which she showed outside. It was one of the things she had noticed about Mrs. Collingham, that she had words for everything. It was like her possession of the house, the gardens, the beautiful things. They gave her spaciousness. Her spirit moved with a larger swing. She could think, feel, express herself strongly, vividly, commandingly, while they, the Follets, had to creep and sneak timidly along the back lanes of life. "'That's why I'm doing it,' she reasoned with herself, "'because I'm in the back lanes of life. I can creep and sneak along, and I can't do anything else.' It was all very well for him to jostle me with his lean iron flank and to growl, but he didn't know what twenty-five thousand would mean to me. Along the line of these musings, Teddy said suddenly, "'Saw young Cole today. Came up and spoke to me. Not a bad sort when you get to know him.' Jenny felt a little faint, but no one noticed it, because Gussie threw back the ball. "'Tell him to come up and speak to me. Any afternoon at half-past five, when I leave Corinne's. "'Say, Gus,' Gladys giggled, "'wouldn't you like a guy with all that wad waiting for you every day "'when Corin shuts down the lid? "'My, the ice-cream sodas he could blow you to!' "'Lizzie was pained. "'It seemed to her that the process of Americanization "'which her children were undergoing "'lay chiefly in the degradation of their speech. "'Gladys, darling, can't you find proper words to—' "'Oh, Mamma dear,' Gladys complained, "'do put a can on all that.' "'If you're a cash girl, you've got to talk English, "'or the other girls will whizzy you round the lot.' "'Young Cole's going to South America,' Teddy informed the party. "'Sails with Huntley on Monday. "'Gosh, wouldn't I like to be going too? "'Say, Dad, why do some fellows come into the world "'with the way all smooth for them "'and their bread buttered in advance?' "'Because,' Gussie declared loftily, "'they're clever and get ahead like Fred Ingalls.' "'I bet you that if his father wanted his taxes and the interest on a mortgage, "'he wouldn't have to raise the wind among his old friends. "'Fred would be Johnny on the spot with the greenbacks.' "'Teddy could only gulp, hang his head over his plate, "'and choke himself with hash as he muttered to his soul, "'God, I'll shoot that Fred Ingalls if I ever get a gun.' "'And just as if she knew that Teddy needed comforting, "'Pansy sprang upon his knees, "'pushing her face up along his breast till she could lick his chin.' Twenty-four hours later, Max was vexing his soul with the difficulty of transcending planes. There was so much of which he could have warned his master, now that he had got him back from Long Island. But there was neither speech nor language, neither symbol nor sign, to make human beings understand anything but the most primitive needs and concepts. Obedience, disobedience, hunger, thirst, sorrow, joy. These sentiments could be put over from the dog plane to the human plane, but without shadings, subtleties, or any of the marvels of intuitive knowledge by which dogs could enlighten men if men had open faculties. To another dog he could have flashed his information in an instant. 
whereas human beings could only seize ideas when they were beaten into them with verbal clubs. Edith and Bob voted Max a nuisance, because in his agony of impotence he pranced restlessly about the bedroom, lashing his tail in one tempo and pointing his ears in another. Edith had come down from the Berkshires on hearing by wire that Bob was to leave next Monday for South America. She was seated now on the bed, her back against the footboard. "'What I don't quite see,' she was saying, "'is how you can be so sure.' Bob looked at her as he stood taking the studs from the soft-bosomed evening shirt in his hand to transfer them to the clean one lying on the bed. "'How can you be so sure about ailing?' "'Well, that's a little different. Ernest speaks our language. He has our ways. Dad and Mother make a fuss because he hasn't a lot of money. But that means no more than if he didn't wear a certain kind of hat. He's our sort, just the same.' "'And I am her sort. I, I can't explain it to you, Edith, but she needs me. "'How do you know she needs you? Has she ever admitted it?' "'I haven't asked her to admit it. I can see. "'Yes, that's all very fine, but did it ever strike you when Hubert's been talking about her that—' "'Bob made an inarticulate sound of scorn as he inserted the cufflinks into a cuff. "'Oh, Hubert's a top-hole chap, all right, but, my Lord, Jenny wouldn't look across the street at him.' "'But he might look across the street at Jenny, and with you so far away.' He smiled with something like a wink. "'Don't you fret about that. She's the kind of little woman to be true. You can't mistake them. "'We've known a good many men who have mistaken them.' "'You haven't known my kind to make that sort of tumble. Love can be blind, but instinct can't be. Edie, I believe so much in that girl that if she was to play me false— but the good Lord, she couldn't. So why talk about it any more? See here, he added, if you're going to change your dress, you'll have to scuttle, and I must get into my waiter's togs. Meanwhile, Dauphin's struggles were of another order. It was the hour of the day which he was accustomed to spend with Collingham, and to spend it undisturbed. In this lovely spring weather they strolled about the gardens, peeped into the hotbeds, dropped in aimlessly at the stable or the garage, exchanged odds and ends of observation with the men working around the place. After this they returned to the house, where, upstairs, in a comfortably masculine bedroom, the man made changes in his outer fur, while the setter, less concerned about trifles, stretched himself out on the floor and blinked. It was a restful time, suited to a mind which, after the stormier years, was growing more and more content with material prosperity, and to a heart that was always content with its master's contentment. But, of late, poor Dauphin had been painfully buffeted by waves of agitation. They emanated from his master like circlets round a stone thrown into a pool. When his master's wife came into the scene, the conflict of forces was terrible. She was not straight with her lord. She was using him, hoodwinking him. Dauphin would have sprung at her throat had it not been for the knowledge that, were he to do so, he would be beaten and kicked by the object of his defence. No, you couldn't deal with human beings sensibly. The wise thing to do was to stretch on the floor and pretend to snooze while they fought their own fight. They didn't precisely fight their own fight just now. Collingham merely accepted terms. He was picking up his evening jacket from the bed on which his valet had laid it out. Junior, dressed exactly to the mean between too little and too much suited for a family dinner, across the threshold of his room, where she stood adjusting a fall of lace. "'As I told you yesterday after she went away, she's just what you'd expect from such a girl. Certainly no better, and possibly a little worse. She's a mousy little thing, with a veneer of modesty. But mercenary isn't the word. It's just a question of money, Bradley, and if you'll leave it to me to deal with—' "'Leave it to you to deal with to the tune of twenty-five thousand dollars,' he said morosely, pulling his coat into shape round his shoulders as he looked into the long glass. "'Well, that's only half of what it might have been. I thought at one time that we might have to make it fifty thousand. He was not sure, but he thought she finished with the word again. If so, it was uttered too softly for him to be obliged to take note of it, so that he merely picked up a hairbrush and put another touch to his hair. She was now at work on the great string of pearls, which, to keep them alive, she wore even in domestic privacy. 
Her object was to get the famous Roehampton pearl, from the late Lady Roehampton's collection, which had been the seal of her reconciliation with Bradley fifteen years earlier, to get this jewel right in the centre of her person, to make the string symmetric. "'My point in bringing it up now,' she said, speaking into her chin as her eyes inspected the long oval of the necklet, "'is to remind you that you don't know anything. You haven't seen Bob for nearly a week, and after Monday you won't see him for two or three months at least. Don't let him suspect that you've anything on your mind. As a matter of fact, you haven't, except what I told you, and I may not tell you everything. And that may be what I complain of. You can't complain of it when I give you the results, now can you? You don't complain of Mr. Bickley, or ask him for all the reasons he has for saying this or that. You leave him a free hand, and are ruled by him. You've often said it even when your own preference would be to do something else, as it was in the case of this man Follett. Now I only claim to be the Mr. Bickley of the family. That he had rights as father, Collingham was aware, though he was shy of putting them forward. Having left them so much in abeyance, it would have been as ridiculous to emphasise them now as to dispute Bickley as efficiency expert at the bank. Moreover, the uneasiness which seizes on a man when his chickens come home to roost inclined him still further to passivity. If Bob was knocking about town, as he seemed to be, he might know about his father what Junior did not, or presumably did not, that the woman who received the fifty thousand dollars had had her successors, and that even now the line was not extinct. What he knew of amusing incidents of fathers and sons meeting on this ground, any such contretour in his own case would have shocked him profoundly. Junior might go beyond her powers in prescribing his course, and yet, for a multitude of reasons too subtle for him to phrase, it seemed wise to follow what Junior prescribed. So the family dined and spent the evening together as tourists walk across the Solfatara Carita. The ground was hot beneath their tread, and here and there a whiff of sulphuric vapour poured through a fissure in the crust. But only Max and Dauphin sensed the volcanic fire. Later in the evening, Junior knelt at her prie-dieu with her armorial books of devotion. "'And, O heavenly Father,' she added to her usual prayer, "'have mercy upon that poor erring girl, and help her to repent. Grant that my son may extricate himself from the toils in which he is entangled. Enable my daughter to see that her duty lies in the station of life to which thou hast been pleased to call her. Give my husband the wisdom to seek advice.' and to follow it. Lead me with thy counsel, so that I may do what is best for all my dear ones. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Having thus poured out her heart, she rose, feeling stronger and more comforted. End of chapter 10《ハリー・ポッターズ・ホグワーツ・ガーデン・ディスネイド・アメリカ》Simon Evers Chapter 11 It should be said for Jenny Follett that, in the matter of her course towards Bob Collingham, she had few of those convictions of sin and righteousness which restrain a proportion of mankind. As with the other members of her family, her conduct followed certain lines because she couldn't help it. That is as far as her analysis would have carried her, though analysis didn't give her much concern. Having so much to do to get food and clothes, the higher laws were outside her sphere of interest. Her chief law was necessity, and it covered so much ground that there was little place for any other law. It may be well to state here that the Follets belonged to that vast American contingent who have practically no religion. They had had a religion in Canada, where they had attended the church of a local god who seemed to hold no sway over the United States. They never found that church in the suburbs of New York, or, if they found it nominally, it didn't, in their opinion, seem the same. There were no local suasions and compulsions to bring them to its doors, and so, after a few spasmodic efforts to re-establish the connection, they gave up the attempt. Perhaps this failure was due to the fact that, in the depths of her strong, proud heart, Lizzie didn't believe in God. Josiah did, or at least he had believed in him up to the time of being thrown upon the scrap-heap. 
but Lizzie's faith in God had died with the dying of her faith in man. She had never said so, because she kept her deeper thoughts to herself. But along these lines her influence on her children had been negative. So Jenny had missed those counsels to do right, which sometimes form a part of domestic education. With so little latitude for doing anything, there was not, apart from the grosser vices, much latitude in the Follett family even for doing wrong. They did what they couldn't help doing, and there was an end of it. A kind of inborn rectitude kept them from offences of which the public would have taken note, but behind it there was little in the way of principle. Jenny went to her farewell meeting with Bob, untroubled by qualms of conscience. Even if scruples had worried her, they would have been allayed by the knowledge, imparted by Bob's own mother, that he had done her a great injury. He made the same kind of love to every girl he had known for an hour, and forgot her the next day. One of these days, the mother had said, some girl would catch him, and then he would be sorry. A girl hadn't caught him in this case, but he had caught a girl, and didn't know what to do with her. Having compelled her to go through a form of marriage, it was no more than a form, he was sailing off to the ends of the world, leaving her not so much as the protection of his name. She owed him nothing, and only the goodness of his angel mother was making up for what he owed to her. And on this side, Bob was so carried away by his romance as to have no conception of Jenny's attitude towards him. Seeing himself as a knight riding to the relief of a damsel in distress, it did not occur to him that the damsel could have a preference as to her deliverer. It was a matter of course that, from the window of the tower in which she was a prisoner, she would drop into his arms. In other words, Bob had his own view of the advantages of being a Collingham. They were great advantages, since they gave him the opportunity of being generous. He was in love with Jenny, largely because she was an exquisite object on which to spend himself. She was a gem, not in the rough, and in, yet in need of polishing, and though his own refinement was not so very great, he could throw refinement in her way. That is to say, love for Bob was very much a matter of giving himself out. Girls who could have brought him everything— and they were not scarce at Murillo Park, didn't interest him. They left no place for the selflessness which was the basis of his character. He couldn't precisely be called kind, since kindness implies some deliberation of the will. As the impulse of a fountain is to pour itself out, so Bob's impulse was to give, while Jenny was a crystal chalice wide open to receive. "'I want you to have everything in the world, Jenny darling,' he declared, bending above her as lovingly as a bench in the park would permit. "'I can't give it to you right off the bat, worse luck, but sooner or later I'll be able to dope you out every little wish. Good Lord, how I'll enjoy it!' "'What do you mean by sooner or later?' Jenny asks, with eyes downcast. "'When I get the family broken to the bit, I can't tell you in dates or time. They'll be hard in the mouth at first, and Mother pulls like the devil.' At this false witness— Jenny was revolted. No one knew better than herself the bigness of that paternal heart, which, as early as next week, would give liberal proof of its sincerity, when Bob's promises would still be in the air. Bob had the afternoon at his disposal. The park offered itself as a delicious trysting place, because it was the month of May. In a nook where lilac and syringa overshadowed them and water glinted between lawns and glades, they sat discreetly, side by side, and she permitted him to hold her hand. He went on to sketch his plans for the immediate future. His most trying lack was that of ready cash. The parental system had always been generous as to things, but penurious in money. In the matter of things he would be as extravagant as he reasonably liked, so long as the bills were sent to Dad. Before he went to work at the bank, his allowance in money wouldn't have kept him in cigarettes. Even now he was only on the weekly payroll for thirty-eight dollars and sixty-six cents per, handed him in a pay envelope. Food, lodging, clothes, saddle horses, motor cars, all these were thrown in extra. But in actual coin he didn't handle more than his two thousand dollars a year, like any other clerk. Jenny could see, therefore, that, to begin with, their position would be difficult, though only to begin with. He could send her a little money while he was away, but it wouldn't be very much. 
"'I don't want you to send me any,' she said hastily. "'You forget that I'm your husband, dear. "'If I didn't, you could bring an action for divorce on the grounds of non-support.' "'This idea being new to Jenny, she had it explained to her, "'rejecting it as a resource because it was unromantic. "'And so to be on the safe side against that,' he laughed, "'I've got this for you now.' "'Slipping an envelope from his pocket, "'he forced it into the hand he was holding. "'It's only a hundred dollars,' he was beginning to explain. "'She snatched her hand away as if he had been stung. "'Oh, Bob, I can't!' "'That situation amused him. "'It was one more proof of the naive honesty of the little girl. "'He knew how hard up she was, how hard up all the family must be. "'And yet money didn't tempt her. "'You're a funny little kid,' he laughed, "'drawing her as near to him as the park laws would permit. "'You'd think I didn't have a right to take care of you.' "'But Jenny was feeling that if she took this money "'she wouldn't be bound to him by principles more acute "'than the promises she had made before the parson. "'No, Bob, I can't. Please don't make me. Please!' "'But in the end he forced it on her, "'and she stowed it away in her little bag. "'By that time, too, she had reviewed the family situation. "'With a hundred dollars in her possession, "'they could less easily be sold out of house and home "'at the end of the following week. "'That calamity, at least, could be dodged, "'whatever other misfortune might overtake herself. "'She might decide that to be sold out of house and home "'would be easier than to bind herself further to Bob "'by using his money. "'But still, she would have the choice.' As to the twenty-five thousand, there was always the possibility that it might not come in time. She had not yet seen Hubert. She couldn't see him till Bob had sailed. When she did, the other woman might be in her place, and her heart would have to break in spite of everything. Better it should break with a hundred dollars in her pocket than that she should be helpless to stay the family disaster. But when Bob sailed on the Monday, she was free to make the great test. Notwithstanding his definite farewells on the Saturday, he tried to see her again on the Sunday, but the necessity for secrecy made it possible for her to put him off. For one thing, she couldn't go through a second time such a good-bye as that of Saturday. Bob had been too much overcome. As unexpectedly to himself as to her, he had broken down. Braving all publicity, he had suddenly seized her hand, pressed it to his lips, and as he bent over it, she could feel his tears against her fingers. He hadn't exactly cried. He had only breathed hard with two great sobs. "'My God, how I love you, Jenny!' she had heard him muttering. "'How I love you! How I love you! How can I do without you all the time till I come back?' When he raised his head, he laughed sheepishly, though the tears were still on his cheeks. "'Forget it, little girl,' he begged unsteadily. "'wiping his cheeks and blowing his nose. "'I just worship you, and that's all there is about it. "'It breaks me all up to go away and leave you. "'But the time will pass, and if I can help it, "'I shall never go away from you again.' "'Defying the park laws once more, "'he had kissed her and kissed her. "'She had let him do it because she was so unnerved. "'Besides, she was sorry for him, "'and would have been sorrier still, "'if she hadn't known that by tomorrow he would have forgotten her. "'That was always the way with fellows who took things so hard. "'The true love was too stern and strong to show emotion. "'Nevertheless, she had had an unhappy Sunday thinking of those two sobs. "'It was not until after ten o'clock on Monday morning "'that she was able to turn again to the compulsion of the man she loved. "'At ten, Bob sailed.' and that episode in Jenny's life was probably behind her. By the time he came back, he would be in love with a girl of his own class, and eager to seize the freedom she, Jenny, would be in a position to deliver him. At last the way was clear. She had only to go to her lover and tell him she was there. She went that afternoon. Her plan was simple. She would say that if he had not yet found a model for the girl in the Byzantine chair— she was ready to do the work. The rest would come as a matter of course. Now that she was face to face with the task, her heart was oddly apathetic. I might be out to buy postage stamps, she said to herself while crossing the ferry. 
Nonetheless, she wished she didn't have to look at this water down which Bob had sailed only four or five hours previously. Off toward the south, in the haze of the warm May afternoon, there was a giant steamer lying as if becalmed. It might be his. There was one still farther out to see. That, too, might be his. Far down on the horizon, just passing out of sight, there was a little black spot with a pennon of black smoke. That could very easily be his. She watched it. It might be carrying him away to where he would forget her. Perhaps he'd forgotten her already. His mother had said, and his mother must know him, that he made love to girls one day and forgot them on the next, and it was already two days since Saturday. Very well, let him forget. Only it didn't seem as if those kisses and those tears were quite in keeping with a heart which treated love so easily. She was glad when the ferry-boat bumped softly against its pier, and she could get away from the great stream of which the very smells and sounds would now begin to make her think of him. She wished there was another means of returning home. She wished he had gone by train. She wished— At the door of the studio building she was seized with a great terror. She began to understand what it was she had come to do. She had come to give herself up. She was to say, in fact, Here I am. Take me. And he would take her, if he hadn't already taken someone else. The betrayal of a husband who was hardly a husband was no longer in her mind. She was appalled at this yielding of herself. Yet she did everything as she had been accustomed to do it, and entered the studio by the door she generally used. At first she thought there was no one there. Certainly the other woman was not there, and that was so far a relief. Slowly, cautiously, she made her way between the brocades, old furniture, and pedestals. Then she saw Hubert, and Hubert saw her. She stood very much as a deer stands when surprised in the bracken, head erect, eyes curious. Till he gave her a sign, she made no movement to go further. And for a minute he gave her no sign. He only remained seated and looked. He looked with a sketch and pencil in his hand. He had been occupied in touching something up. But she couldn't mistake it. It was the girl in the Byzantine chair. Her heart, which seemed to swell to thrice its size, thumped painfully. Then, at last, a smile broke over his face, lifting his moustache and mounting to his violet eyes. He didn't speak. He didn't move. He only looked, hushed, enraptured, as the hunter at the startled deer. End of chapter 11